Why don't you turn with me to the book of Esther, page 433 in your Bibles, and uh, we're going to read the first 12 verses of chapter 1. We're actually going to cover the first two chapters today, uh, and we're going to be doing Esther over four weeks. In your newsletter, you've got uh, a copy of a preaching postcard uh, with a memory verse as well. Uh, Memory verse Sunday is the last Sunday of the school holidays. And then also in your newsletter, you've got a sheet that looks like this. Uh, On one side uh, is a a timeline and then a map. And then on the other side, for those who aren't visual people, but people who like reading, you've got the same timeline, uh, but done in words. Hold that uh, and you can use that to refer to uh, as we work our way through Esther. Esther chapter 1, verses 1 to 12. These events took place during the days of Ahasuerus, who ruled 127 provinces from India to Kush. In those days, King Ahasuerus reigned from his royal throne in the fortress at Susa. He held a feast in the third year of his reign for all his officials and staff, the army of Persia, Media, the nobles and the officials from the provinces. He displayed the glorious wealth of his kingdom and the magnificent splendour of his greatness for a total of 180 days. At the end of this time, the king held a week-long banquet in the garden courtyard of the royal palace for all the people from the greatest to the least who were present in the fortress of Susa. White and violet linen hangings were fastened with fine white and purple linen cords to silver rods on marble columns. Gold and silver couches were arranged on a mosaic pavement of red feldspar, marble, mother of pearl and precious stones. Beverages were served in an array of gold goblets, each with a different design. Royal wine flowed freely according to the king's bounty and no restraint was placed on the drinking. The king had ordered every wine steward in his household to serve as much as each person wanted. Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women of King Ahasuerus' palace. On the seventh day, when the king was feeling good from the wine, Ahasuerus commanded Mahuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zetha and Karkas, the seven eunuchs who personally served him, to bring Queen Vashti before him with her royal crown. He wanted to show off her beauty to the people and the officials because she was very beautiful. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command that was delivered by his eunuchs. The king became furious and his anger burned within him. This is the word of the Lord. Let me begin with a quote. Anti-Semites have always hated the book and the Nazis forbade its reading in the crematoria and the concentration camps. In the dark days before their deaths, Jewish inmates of Auschwitz, Dachau, Treblinka and Bergen-Belsen wrote the book of Esther from memory and read it in secret on Purim. Both they and their brutal foes understood its message. I don't know what those camps were like. We have an inkling, don't we, through some of the footage we've seen. I don't know the questions people asked, but I guess they were pretty heart-rending. I don't know the wrestling that happened, but I guess at points it was soul-destroying. Where do God's mob fit in this world? Where is God at a moment like this? How secure or even influential can the people of God ever be? How do we understand our place with any clarity or wisdom? How do we navigate such a world with so much extravagance, opulence, power and wealth concentrated in the hands of so few? Today, in circumstances as we look around which are far less life-threatening, aren't they? Far less life-threatening. How do God's mob exist in a world dominated by a social media storm, a supercomputer in our back pocket, and the constant clamour from both that says, look at me, I'm important, pay attention to me. And what are God's mob to do when such a world filters down to our playgrounds, our sport and social scenes? When such a world starts to say, that's acceptable, that's not. That's needed, that must be done. 
in such a way that the very existence of God's mob is threatened and they don't know where they stand. Esther speaks to those questions. Let's pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you uh, that it was read in the concentration camps. Thank you that it was memorised in those camps and written down. Thank you that we can sit here in great freedom with lights and comfort and food and thank you that we can still read it. Our Father, you are not mentioned in Esther, but you are present, as we'll find out over the next few weeks. And we give thanks that you don't change, even though we are so often compromised. Thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to acknowledge straight up, uh, I've struggled with Esther. (laughs) It's a very strange and bizarre little book. Uh, Martin Luther didn't want it in the Bible because he didn't know what to do with it. Uh, uh, It's a historic book, but it's historic literature dealing with historical people in realities in such an amazing and complicated literary way. Uh, For those who've studied Wilfred Owen, the World War I poet, it's like Wilfred Owen poems which talk about a reality but use amazing language. It's kind of like literary history beefed up on steroids. That's Esther. Uh, For a book in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, uh, the gasp from the kids was appropriate. Uh, It doesn't mention God. It makes no mention of God's law, and it makes no mention of the land of Israel. That's a strange little book. Uh, For a book in the Bible, it's striking that it's not mentioned once or referred to at all in the New Testament. The time and the culture are very foreign to us. They're strange in their brutality, mind-blowing in their extravagance, and confronting in their selfishness. And for a book in the Bible, I think it is very uncomfortable to have so much ambiguity. You say, I open a book in the Bible. I want someone to tell me what the motives are. Why did they do this? What's going on in their minds? Where are the explanatory statements? There's none in the book of Esther. We just have a bare record of what takes place. And I think that strangeness is important for us to grasp. We've got to read it as it is right in front of us. We've got to accept that it's going to be uncomfortable. We've got to actually listen to everything that's absent. Listen to the silences and embrace the fact that things aren't always as clear as we'd like. All of this strangeness in the first two chapters sets up the rest of the book. Make sure you've got it open uh, because we're going to skip fairly quickly through the first two chapters. Page 433, these events took place during the days of Ahasuerus who ruled 127 provinces from India to Kush. In those days, King Ahasuerus reigned from his royal throne in the fortress at Susa. He held a feast in the third year of his reign for all his officials and staff the army of Persia and Media, the nobles and the officials from the provinces. He displayed the glorious wealth of his kingdom and the magnificent splendor of his greatness for a total of 180 days. Meet Ahasuerus. Notice we don't start with God or God's people or the land. Meet Xerxes because that's his other name. Literally he is man of men, king of kings. There's no bloke like this bloke. There is no man like him in the whole universe. Came to power in 486 BC. Rules the whole known world from India to the Sudan, if you think modern globe. India to the Sudan. I struggle to rule my laundry. Imagine running that. 127 provinces known for its wonderful administrative efficiency. If you posted a letter, it was going to get there. If you passed a law, it was going to go to everyone. And this guy holds all the wealth and military power in his hands alone. Man of men, king of kings. So we immediately have a place to put this book, don't we? Uh, Let me just tell you of some other events in the world at that time and some of the stuff that has gone on with God's people so we know where to place it. Kind of like our clothesline with the kids. Uh, Over in Greece, Socrates is busy philosophizing. And Pythagoras is mucking around with triangles. So we're at the same time as those two blokes over there. In terms of God's mob, they've been taken into exile. 
They didn't treasure God dwelling with them. And so God did as he promised. He kicked them out of the land that was meant to be theirs, a symbol of him hanging out with them. Uh, The last mob have been taken from Jerusalem and Judah, that southern rump, by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. That's 605 to 586 BC. That's where we have Daniel. Daniel's taken away in that time. The temple is destroyed and Daniel lived in exile for 70 years. Jeremiah and other prophets talking at the same time. Babylon is replaced by Persia, 539 BC. Persia is ruled by a bloke called Cyrus and Cyrus gives an option for God's people to go home, to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple, to resettle the land around. That was 538 BC. The temple is completed in 516 BC. Haggai, Zechariah, they're the blokes around that time. So now we know where it fits. Pythagoras over here with his triangles. Some of God's mob have gone back to rebuild the temple. But all of it's ruled by Persia. All of it. So Xerxes likes to be known and noticed He holds a magnificent banquet, 180 days. Can you imagine being the cooks? All of his officials, all of his soldiers, all of his military, all of his admin come to the capital and hang there for 180 days. Why? We will tell the reason there in verse 4, aren't we? Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. I am the man of men the king of kings. And at the end of 180 days, in case he hadn't had enough, there's a week-long feast in his special enclosed garden. And that, as we'll see in God's word of verse 5, is for the people of Susa, from the greatest to the least, in case they had felt overlooked. Can you imagine what the invite would look like? Come and meet the man of men, the king of kings. Look at his wall hangings. Look at his floor. Lie on his couches. Drink as much as you can from his cellars, from a cup. That'll be different to everyone else's cup. Come along. Can you imagine the invite? And in fact, this guy is so powerful that he passes a royal decree that can never be undone so you know how to drink at his parties. He passes a law to make sure that you don't stop drinking. That's how powerful this guy is. And and at the end of a party like that, when you're thinking very clearly, verse 10, on the seventh day when the king was feeling good from the wine, Ahasuerus commanded Mahuman, Bizthar, Harbona, Bigthar, Abagthar, Zethar and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who personally served him, to bring Queen Vashti before him with her royal crown. He wanted to show off her beauty to the people and the officials because she was very beautiful. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command that was delivered by his eunuchs. The king became furious and his anger burned within him. Look at me. And Vashti says, no way. Vashti's been having her own party for seven days. We learn about that in verse 9. And notice that we're given no reason or motive. We're not told what she was thinking. But her no exposes Xerxes for what he is. He's a man so powerful that he can legislate your drinks in his own home whose queen stands up to him. What kind of power is that? And you know how it is when you're drunk. Well, I hope you don't. But like so many drunken men, he decides to make life-changing decisions, doesn't he? He calls all of his advisors in and the assumption is they've been partying for 187 days so they're not that sharp. And like so many other drunk men in history, what was a simple no becomes a matter of national security, doesn't it? It becomes a matter of pride and influence. Shock horror, Vashti's refusal undermines all of known society and humiliates every man, and so something must be done. Can you imagine the deliberations of those eight drunk men? Well, let's send a decree around saying Vashti's no longer queen. 
and she can't enter the king's presence. That'll do it. Until you stop and think about it. Because all they've just legislated is what Vashti's already done. She just had to say no. And yet they've got to pass a law. And in fact, they've just exposed to the whole empire how humiliated their king is. No one needed to know, but oh, let's pass a decree around to everyone about Vashti. I mean, what kind of power do you have when you have to legislate how people drink and then issue a decree that achieves what your queen already did when she said no? What a man of men. What a king of kings. And so by the time we get to the end of Esther 1, we've got a picture of the world, don't we? <laughs> And the picture of the world is striking because it doesn't start with God's mob. And there's no mention of God. And we're meant to catch that absence, aren't we? It's a world of unbelievable extravagance, unbelievable self-centeredness, unbelievable pride, arrogance and power. It's a world of indulgence and inward-looking arrogance. It's a world that legislates how you can drink and what spouses should do. It's a world revealed as empty, hollow, and toothless that overreacts and contradicts. Does that sound like anything familiar to you? That kind of world? Well, sometime later, I'm at point three on the outline, sometime later when King Ahasuerus's rage had cooled down, he remembered Vashti and what she'd done and what was decided against her. The king's personal attendants suggested, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in each province of his kingdom so that they may assemble all the beautiful young virgins to the harem at the fortress of Susa. Put them under the care of Hegai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Give them the required beauty treatments. Then the young woman who pleases the king will reign in place of Vashti. This suggestion pleased the king, and he did accordingly. It's hard work when you sober up, isn't it? How can you be the man of men, the king of kings, and you've misplaced your queen? I mean, the guy looks like a fool, doesn't he? And so his personal attendant makes a suggestion, and his personal attendants know how Xerxes thinks and acts. This is not a beauty pageant or a competition. Let me be blunt. This is a state-sponsored brothel. All the most gorgeous virgins are hoovered up by the commissioners. They are brought. You got to remember the power of the guy who legislates what you drink. And they're all brought to the capital. They're all given a beauty spa. And then they're all sampled by the king until he finds his queen. What are we meant to see here? That's an exercise in sexual indulgence, isn't it? It panders to the ego of a spoilt and self-centred and impulsively indulgent ruler who can't control himself. There is nothing nice about this. And notice that we're meant to understand that in that verse that says, this suggestion pleased the king. Of course it did. And he did accordingly. A Jewish man was in the fortress of Susa named Mordecai, son of Jer, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjaminite. He'd been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the other captives when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon took King Jeconiah of Judah into exile. Mordecai <laughs> was the legal guardian of his cousin Hadassah, that is Esther, because she didn't have a father or mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was extremely good looking. When her father and mother died, Mordecai had adopted her as his own daughter. Some things should automatically stand out. The names, Mordecai and Esther, they're not Jewish names. They're Persian names. Mordecai, worshipper of Marduk, the head Persian god. So, so as one of God's people reading this, you're meant to kind of go, ooh, that's a bit confronting. They're exiles. They're part of that group that have been kicked out of the land God promised them because they didn't treasure God wanting to live with them. They're not in their homeland. They're left behind. 
many other Jews have gone back to Jerusalem, but these ones haven't, though every Jew still remains under Persia. And when we're introduced to Mordecai, we're meant to notice that he's in the family tree of Saul, the first king of God's people. 1 Samuel chapter 9. Mordecai is caring for his relative Esther. She is effectively by law his daughter, and Esther is stunningly beautiful, so we know what's going to happen, don't we? (laughs) We've already been told what's going to take place. We know the situation of Mordecai and Esther. They are in a minority, and Esther is stunning. It's no surprise that she's gathered up. And when she's gathered up and taken to Susa and placed with all those other gorgeous young women, she gains the approval of everyone she meets. She is a striking woman who impresses everyone. But notice the ambiguity. Look there in verse 10. But Esther did not reveal her ethnic background or her birthplace because Mordecai had earled at her not to. Every day, Mordecai took a walk in front of the harem's courtyard to learn how Esther was doing, to see what was happening to her. At that point, you meant to go, hang on, Daniel? What did Daniel do? Well, Daniel was out and proud, wasn't he? Stood up to the pagan overlords, even to the point of being thrown into the fire. But what what about Mordecai and Esther? And we think of those who've proudly worn the label of God's mob throughout history. What, What about Mordecai and Esther? We think of those who didn't hide their relationship with God. What about Mordecai and Esther? There is so much here that's strange. Jeremiah the prophet in 29, Jeremiah 29, had actually told God's people to settle down, prosper Babylon and Persia. And yet on the other hand, Daniel stood up and refused to eat that and refused to bow to that and it went all right for him. What about Mordecai and Esther? What what are we to make of this? I think we've got to recognise that it's a pretty ambiguous situation, isn't it? They're navigating a landscape that's misty and rough, where things seem to be shifting all the time. Does that sound familiar to you? And let me tell you, the text doesn't approve or disprove, but it says it as it is. And perhaps Mordecai and Esther made some foolish decisions. And perhaps they shouldn't be on a pedestal we so often put them on. Well, in case we misunderstand what's going on, verses 12 to 14 tell us about how the Queen's selection worked. Uh, You received a year of beauty treatment, 12 months at the spa. Then you had a night with the king to take whatever you could to persuade him that you were the one. After that one night, you were then moved to a second harem. And let me tell you, that's where you live the rest of your life. You didn't go home. You were there forever. It's really quite horrible, isn't it? Esther's turn comes. She trusts in what the chief official advises. After all, he knows Xerxes. And the night comes, verse 16, Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus in the royal palace in the 10th month, the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women. She won more favour and approval from him than did any of the other virgins. He placed a royal crown on her head and made her queen in place of Vashti. The king held a great banquet for all his officials and staff. It was Esther's banquet. He freed his provinces from tax payments, gave his gifts worthy of the king's bounty. Did you notice how long this is after chapter 1? It's four years. (laughs) We've waited four years for this night. And Esther impresses the king. The king chooses her and crowns her and another banquet happens. Always pay attention to the banquets because they're key events. Now, I think we've got to be blunt. Esther is in exile. The power balance, talking in our world, the power balance is unbelievable, isn't it, between Xerxes and Esther. But we've got to actually deal with the text. Esther is compromised. She's broken God's laws about food. She's broken God's laws about sex. And she's broken God's laws about marriage. She's compromised on so many levels, isn't she? And the text doesn't offer us a moral assessment. It just presents us with how ambiguous the situation is. 
how tough it would be. And she still hasn't revealed her heritage. During those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Big Thar and Teresh, two eunuchs who guarded the king's entrance, became infuriated and tried to assassinate King Ahasuerus. When Mordecai learned of the plot, he reported it to Queen Esther. She told the king on Mordecai's behalf when the report was investigated and verified. Both men were hanged on the gallows. This event was recorded in the court records of daily events in the king's presence. We've got compromised Esther. And, and what does Mordecai do? That's a, just think about that. You've actually saved the life of the cruel imperial oppressor who threatens your people. That's remarkable, isn't it? You had the chance to let this plot go through and that cruel, horrible, selfish man who has stolen your legal daughter, he could have been assassinated. And what, what does Mordecai do? Saves you. Why? We're not told why. Would you do that? Do you see how strange this book is? How confronting? So what do we make of it? I'm at the last point on the outline. We can at least assess this. Steve, who's preaching next week, that's right, isn't it? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> at least the stage is set. Everything is in place. We have the whole known world and what it's like as we look at the man of men and the king of kings. And then we have God's people, don't we? That little group in exile who are struggling to work out how to navigate such a shifting landscape. So let me finish with three observations very quickly. Please read this book as it is, like it is right in front of you. It is strange, it is distant, it is bizarre, but just read it as it is. Notice the absences. Notice the lack of moral assessment. Notice the way in which reality is described. Notice the deliberate ambiguity and the compromises and the heights of heroism. And, and as you do that, as you read the book just as it is, not influenced by anything else, as you read it like that, then read it as part of the big book, God's Word so that we start to grasp some of the intricacies. We begin to understand the situation God's mob found them in. Did you, did you listen to Roz's reading from Philippians chapter 3? It actually used a word that is so relevant. It's the only time that particular word is used in around verse 20, uh, the only time that particular word is used in the whole New Testament of citizenship. We're exiles. Where's our citizenship? What questions are we asking? How does life go for us as exiles when we read about Esther and Mordecai? Second, recognise the reality of this world. The portrait of the power of the world, the indulgence, the extravagance, the hollowness, the empty authority, the disgusting glitter, the perversion. Do, do you recognise any of that? And then what about God's mob as exiles, a minority with a power imbalance, as a people navigating a landscape half understood, understanding compromise and just regretting compromise, acts of heroism and then hiding? And Do you recognise any of that? What it means to be God's people? And please grasp the questions that this raises for us. We recognise how evil Persia is. We recognise the precarious situation faced by God's mob. Do we actually acknowledge the compromise that we read about? The compromise that comes as Mordecai and Esther grapple with these questions. Where's God? Where do we fit? How do God's mob make wise decisions? What is wisdom? And as we do that, let's make sure that Esther and Mordecai don't end up on a pedestal. The compromises are described. They're neither approved or disproved. They're just put there. Obviously, it doesn't disqualify these people from being in God's word. Just look at how Mordecai saves Xerxes. There is a lot in this strange little book, isn't there? That is quite confronting. And so much reveals the nature of who we truly are. Mordecai and Esther are just like us. We're just like them. And we must allow God's word to use them to make us uncomfortable, 
to expose us so that our eyes go to the real hero of this strange little story. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you for the book of Esther. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know when they wrote it. We know the circumstances about which it speaks. Father, there is so much in this book that describes our world today. Help us to listen to it as it is and as it is in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.